How the Jews Betrayed Mankind, Volume 1, The Sumerian Swindle, Second Edition by G underscore D, Chapter 6, Time in History, Warfare and Money Lending. I'm going to break this chapter up by subchapter, because it is about 130 pages long, this chapter alone. So, I will record the first subchapter. Actually, I will not. That one is only about a page long. Well, let's just get started. We'll see where we go. Although it was a tradition passed down to the Sumerians that all culture came from the town of Eridu, it was from the much larger town of Uruk that Mesopotamian culture began to flourish. Uruk is the Sumerian city from which the modern state of Iraq got its name. That's Uruk. U-R-U-K is where both the sky god Anu and the goddess of love Inanna resided in their great temples. At its height, Uruk probably had 50,000 to 80,000 residents living in six square kilometers of walled area, the largest city in the world at its time. Uruk was one of the world's first cities with a dense population. Uruk also saw the rise of the centralized state in Mesopotamia with the full-time bureaucracy, military, and the stratified social classes of the haves and have-nots. All of this was accomplished by 3700 BC by the Ubadians before writing was invented. Cities that coexisted with Uruk at this time were only about 10 hectares in area, showing that it was a vastly larger and more complex city than any of its contemporaries. To the rural Sumerians who began buying up the foreclosed farms from the Ubadian moneylenders, Uruk, with its high walls surrounding two- and three-story mud-brick buildings and its five-story mud-brick temple, must have been an awesome wonder. Uruk was an important city because it represented a shift from small, agricultural villages to a larger urban center, and it is from here, around 3200 BC to 3000 BC, that the crude bookkeeping scratchings on, the, on clay that the Ubadians had been using were turned into the world's first writing by the Sumerians. With this invention, the dawn of written history began, and through the trade routes between Mesopotamia and Egypt, the invention of writing spread to the land of the pharaohs. Because the Sumerians bought the land from the Ubadian moneylenders and so acquired control gradually, they were able to learn the cultural, religious, political, business, and social traditions of the Ubadians, peacefully, without warfare. The greedy Ubadian moneylenders were eager to sell the swindled properties for silver and to train the new immigrants in the ways of ownership and confiscation. The Ubadian have-nots could not prevent the new arrivals from displacing them because they were betrayed by the haves, who were, in turn, protected by the king. So whether the poor Ubadians worked in the fields for the Ubadian moneylenders or for the new owners of the property, the pay was the same. The new Sumerian owners did not come as conquerors so much as they appeared as the new landlords of the land and all that was on it. All that was on it included whatever slaves, hired hands, and poor farmers who were working the land for subsistence wages. As their numbers increased through immigration of their relatives, the Sumerians were soon masters of the land. As co-owners and social equals with the Ubadian Aulum, has, the moneylenders taught them everything about Mesopotamian society, inventions, agriculture, urban management, and religion. Once their children were grown up, within a single generation, the Sumerians had mastered it all and had begun to add their own ingenuity to the culture. As more Sumerians bought land and moved their foreign relatives onto the property, all traces of the indigenous Ubadian culture vanished. A new people speaking a new language had become the owners of Mesopotamia. The Sumerians continued with all of the cultural traditions that had always been here. The religion, the social structure, the inventions, and the frauds and swindles of lending at interest. New subchapter. Sumerian Mathematics and the Babylonian Calendar. Writing on clay tablets not only allowed the Sumerians to communicate over long distances, but it created a whole new way of owning property as well. Actually living on a farm or in a townhouse became secondary to possessing a clay tablet that said that the owner of the tablet was the owner of the property. Written deeds of ownership conferred to the haves both power and wealth on a much grander scale. 
they could own vast estates without having to physically live on those properties. From the temple priests, the Sumerians learned the myths and the indigenous religion. From the greedy Ubedian moneylenders, they learned the ways of land ownership and lending at interest. Enslaving their fellow men to fraudulent interest on a loan scams was already in place when they arrived. They merely made the system more efficient and productive of profit with the invention of compound interest. The Sumerian swindle is the basis of everything that we have today in the modern world of banking, stock markets, financial schemes, investment frauds, credit card scams, foreclosed homes, money laundering, national debt, inflation, depression, and related larcenies. And we accept these criminal activities and let the crooks abscound with the loot merely because they have always been here. With writing, the Sumerians made it impossible for men's memories to forget their promises about loan and rental agreements. No longer could a farmer, whose property was being confiscated, claim that the verbal agreement was different than what the moneylender had claimed. Now, their contracts and business agreements were literally written in stone. Once the clay tablet was written upon and baked in, in an oven, it was literally a stone-hard clay brick. As far as its durability, modern archaeologists today can read these contracts just as clearly as the day they were written 5,000 years ago. Not even modern computer disks or paper documents have that kind of longevity. So, again, don't look down upon the, these ancient people as mere primitives because they accomplished things that not even modern science has been able to equal to this day. Along with writing, mathematics became an important and powerful tool that enabled the Sumerians to reach heights of never-before-achieved wealth. Because it has always been here, some of you modern people may find it difficult to imagine that there was ever any other kind of counting system other than the base 10 method that we use today. It has only been in the last 500 years that the Arabic numerals of 0 through 9 have, been, have become common and popular, a counting system that the Arabs stole from India. These allow us to simply and easily make complex calculations, but this system was only developed because of the previous seven millennia of experimentation with many other systems of counting. The first of these counting and mathematics systems was the Sumerian system of base 60 numbers. Since most of us have 10 digits on our hands and toes, it may seem odd that anyone would want to count by multiples of 60 instead of multiples of 10. But there was a very practical reason to count with a base 66 system. It may have gotten started by figuring the monthly rations for workers at two meals per day over a 30-day month, but it proved to be much more ingenious than that. In a society where people were paid for their work with food rations as well as with silver, a number 60-based counting system was very useful. The Sumerians were a very practical people in everything that they did. Their numbering system had a lot of benefits, especially when dividing up goods among many people. With a base 60 counting system, physical things could be easily portioned out. Rents paid in produce or wages paid in portions of grain were easily calculated with a base 60 system. A base 60 system has many more factors than our base 10 decimal system. The factors of 60 are 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, 15, 20, 30, as compared with only 1, 2, and 5 in our base 10 system. Thus, a greater variety of equal portions could be evenly divided and distributed with a base 60 system than with our base 10 system. This means that fractions and weights and measures could be expressed with great precision and individual portions could be evenly divided out of a community lot. Also, portions could be easily divided for groups of people each having different numbers of individuals in the group. And in an agricultural society where several families of varying numbers of individuals would work on the same project, being able to equally divide the harvest between them or to portion out the individual shares of the ration payment to them was an advantage for this kind of number system. Although the base 60 counting system may seem odd and difficult for us to understand, it was really quite simple. Its only real defect was that it didn't have a zero. The Mesopotamians used their base 60 numbering system for 3,000 years before it was replaced by Roman numerals, while we have used the Arabic numerals for only 500 years and the metric system for only 200 years. Take a moment to think about the relative length of those time spans and how young as a people we modern folk really are. One of the advantages for the base 60 system was that Sumerian weights and measures were also base 60. 180 barley grains. 3 times 60 made one shekel weight, 
Sixty shekels made one mina. Sixty minas made one talent. This Sumerian system is hinted at in the Bible where individuals demanded their portion while payments were made in shekels of silver. A shekel is about 10 grams or less than a third of an ounce. The advantage of using the same base 60 for weights and measures was that the math rules were the same as when calculating fractions. The divisors for conversion of one weight to the next lowest level were, like the denominators, standard. This numbering system became standard for the entire ancient Near East for 20 centuries. And of course, the 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 360 degrees in a circle, 15 year and 30 year mortgages are all our inheritance of Sumerian genius that we still use today. These measurements and their significance for the modern day swindles of the Jews, such as 15 and 30 year mortgages, will be covered in volume 3, The Bloodsuckers of Judah. But for now, Please understand that even though these Sumerian people might seem to you to be very ancient and very primitive, it must be understood that they were just like you and me, homo sapiens, with all of the same genetic intelligence as a modern person and the same crafty shrewdness of a modern loan shark, thief, or banker. To get an idea of the Sumerian skills in mathematics, they developed equations containing two unknowns, using plus or minus in a single algebraic statement. They did not use mathematical proofs because their main interest was in practical solutions to problems and not to mathematical theories. Also, they tried at all times to use the base 60 counting system so that it would not produce irregular numbers that were neither prime to nor prime to nor a factor of base 60. They used the Pythagorean theorem centuries before the Greeks. Pythagorean theorem centuries before the Greeks. They understood geometric shapes and formula. They developed algebraic methods. They calculated pi to 3 and 1 8. Their mathematical tables dealt with multiplication, reciprocals for division, squares and cubes, square roots and cube roots, exponential tables, logarithms, and metrological tables of length, area, monetary conversion, and weight units. They solved equations with up to six unknowns and even to the eighth degree. Solid geometric figures were dealt with in practical problems which related to bricks and brickworks, excavation of canals, and earthwork construction such as walls, dams, and ramps. They calculated practical problems such as prices, commerce, inheritance or division of property, the water clock, field plans, herd growth, reed bundles, and standardized measuring containers. With such a varied and precise system of numbers, not only were the Sumerians able to create the world's first civilization, but also they used their math skills to finally tune the Sumerian swindle to its present-day perfidious perfection. Perfidious perfection. Interest on a loan, usury, time payments, and that diabolical invention known as compound interest were all refined to a high business science by the Sumerians. Yes, the Sumerians developed the scientific math upon which the wonders of modern engineering and science are established, but they also developed that grand larceny known as business math upon which our modern burdens of high taxes, national debts, and banking swindles are firmly bound. The Sumerian landowners and moneylenders used a funnel in the middle of an ox-drawn plow for dropping seeds into a furrow. With this invention, they were able to precisely seed an entire field and to calculate in advance how much seed would be needed for every field to a precision of just one seed kernel. With such math skills combined with greed and craftiness, the Sumerian moneylenders developed a finely honored, excuse me, finely owned, honed, pincer and shackle for extracting every shekel from the purses of the people around them. From the skills of planting fields to a precision of a single seed grain to calculating exact volumes of water for irrigated fields along with precise times of watering both during the day and night, calculating rations for work crews and profits from investments, the Sumerian Alwilum have became master schemers. Mouth getting a little dry here. But wealth, itself, is made over a period of time, and time was something else these people learned to manipulate. The ancient Mesopotamians were aware of both the lunar and solar calendar, but the lunar calendar took precedence. In fact, in their mythology, the Sumerians depicted the moon as the father of the sun. 
An intercalary month was added to guarantee that the religious festivals, which were connected to the lunar calendar, were observed at the proper time. Gradually, by the 8th century BC, a regular intercal <laughs> intercalation of seven months every 19 years was established. Its accuracy in reconciling the lunar and solar calendars is still admired. By the 4th century BC, mathematical astronomy was used for this intercalation. I'm going to look that up, because I'm not... Oh. My browser's not open. Some other time, then. The calendar... Oh, now it is. Real quickly. Intercalation. Intercalation. Is the reversible inclusion or insertion of a molecule, or ion, into materials with layered structures. Mathematical astronomy was used for this intercalation. The calendar produced was called the Metonic Cycle, which was the basis of the Babylonian calendar which the Jews use today. Yes, the Jews of today, though they boast about being the first Adam and Eve original people, actually prove the fallacy of their ridiculous claims in so many, many ways. Their use of the Babylonian calendar, which, the, which they merely renamed the Jewish calendar, is one of the proofs that they are liars, since the Babylonians lived tens of centuries before they were, there were any Jews. But more about this later. Through observation and calculation, the Mesopotamians were able to compile tables of fixed stars and the distances between them. The results were amazing, considering the available equipment. Tubes used as viewfinders, the water clock, a rudimentary sundial, and a kind of shadow clock. The distance between the stars found on the Tropic of Cancer was even measured using three systems. One, time between the passages of two stars at the meridian as measured with a water clock. Two, the arc, and three, length according to either linear measurements or according to degrees. The mathematical astronomy of Mesopotamia was highly sophisticated. Basic knowledge of astronomy was collected and organized relating to the moon, the position of the planets, solstices, eclipses, equinoxes, serious phenomena, meteors, comets, and so on. The tables of new and full moons were accurate. In fact, it was a Babylonian astronomer, Cadenas, K-I-D-E-N-A-S, who calculated the length of the solar year with a margin of error of 4 minutes and 32.65 seconds. Thus, you can see how very intelligent and precise the knowledge of these ancient people was. They were not stupid, so do not misunderstand that these were modern people who were living in ancient times and were a ancient people living in modern times. And their skills at calculating interest on a loan was as precise as any modern banker. By developing an accurate way to divide the weeks and hours, workers could be better controlled and expenditures planned. With accurate ways to predict the seasons, planting and harvesting could be regulated. The festivals and feasts could be planned for the entire country with accurate times prescribed. With planning in relation to time came the ability to plan and coordinate the movements of people, the logistics and projected profits from business deals, the coordination of armies, and the profits from war. And when it comes to calculating profits, nothing is more profitable for a money lender than is war. And that concludes that subchapter, and we'll pick back up with the 3000 BC Bronze Age Sumerian Civilization.